What's up everybody? My name is Kevin Toppenberg. Today is an exciting day. I have been restoring this mill and today's video is where we make it all the way to the end. This is the last video in the series. We're going to work on the terrible rattle we heard up in here and we're also going to work on a problem where the thing's not going up and down right and we're going to work on the pins and all sorts of mess and of course, you know, I always get myself into trouble. I will say that today's video is longer than usual, but it's the holidays and I hope maybe everyone have a little bit extra time to watch it and I hope you enjoy it. Let's give this a test. Not doing anything. That doesn't sound good. What's that? I think the rattling was coming from this, which was just sitting up there loose, and I think it was spinning. It's not coming from the motor, because when I disconnect the belt, there's no sound, so it must be coming from inside that step pulley and where the brake is. So I changed it, so I'm using the highest pulley. In other words, the motor goes the fastest and the spindle goes the slowest, and I don't get any of it, that rattling then. It just started pouring outside. I don't know if that'll come across on the audio or not. So when I was redoing this mill, I purposefully did not take the mill all apart. I mean, I took the head off and I think I took the layer in here just to look at the gear and it looked okay, but I didn't go into any of these inner parts. Now having a rattle here that sounds like it's coming up in here. So I need to take that off and go through it. I think I have a bad bearing and I've been working over an hour on getting these open. And I wanted to show a couple of tricks that I found. Number one, when you go to turn this, the hard tarp is you know, getting a counter force to make that nut twist. So you try to grab onto the bottom and you just can't hold on tight enough. But if you put this in this, in like the back gear, but then have this go down, then the two parts lock against each other. And then that, plus one of these spanner wrenches and uh, some force, now it's loose now. All right, so I got this out. Then the second part was this outer ring. And that has a different thing that's moving. And I can't show it right now, but there is some pins that go in here that uh, keep it from rotating when you go up and down. And I didn't really want to put too much force on those holes for, I didn't want to bugger them out. But in this particular one, someone had already buggered the holes up and they'd made a new set. So I was able to actually rotate this around and get the set lined up. So putting that in, hitting with a hammer, I was able to get this outer ring loose. All right, I'm back here at the bench and just wanted to show this. That'll need to be cleaned up, obviously. The outer ring screws into this part. The inner ring screws into, it screws on this shaft. The outer ring, has a rim on the side that puts load on the outside of the bearing. And this part puts load on the inside of the bearing and that's how you're gonna tension your bearing appropriately. And this is why I think that my bearing is bad. Listen. That doesn't sound uh, very sporty. And I think that's what's causing that rattle I'm hearing. So I'm gonna get those bearings out and see if we can get them replaced. This center shaft, uh, which had the threads on it, I drove out with a soft blow hammer, and you can see that it's uh, coming apart here. There's a key there, and I'm gonna try to get it the rest of the way out with some wood or something to not cause any problems. So that's what that looks like. Looks like it just needs to be cleaned up a little bit. And then this unit will come free, and that's got our bearings in it. It's got a bearing, and then a spacer, and then another bearing. The brand is Fafnir. And then it says C1 and 207 KDD. And that's the same on this side as well. I just got some old grease and stuff in there. I'll probably polish that up. And let's try to get this out. All right, I just have it spaced up a little bit here. I have like three quarters of an inch to begin with. I've now reached the edge there. One fell out. I'm gonna put those carefully there so I can look at the orientation of them. Okay, so this face that has the, the letters that was facing up and the other one was facing down. Let's see if there's a tail on these, if this has any writing on the back side. Looks like it has the same writing. 
So I can't tell any difference one side versus the other. Then it's got this outer spacer and then an inner spacer. Yeah, that one's not spinning smoothly at all and it sounds rough. That one sounds terrible. I think I got my work cut out. I gotta order some bearings. So I've got most of the grease off this just to review. We got this outer shell. It had two holes here and two holes here. This little one has a set screw. This one has a set screw, but these ones did not. So these are the old ones and then someone clocked it and put in a new pair. They were both quarter 28, I think it is. Let me see, it's quarter five. Quarter 28, so I, I ran a tap through both of those. Even the one that's, that's wallowed out, I mean, it's flopping, but it's not, it's not terrible. So that one's pretty tight. All right, then I've got my bearings cleaned off and it does appear that there's no polarity. These bearings are the same on either side and I got my inner and my outer spacers. So I need to go find some equivalent bearings. This one doesn't make a lot of noise, but it's very stiff. It doesn't rotate very well. So I think they probably both need to be replaced. On the prior mill I restored, this ring wouldn't stay on. It was really loose. And just looking at this one, it looks like they heat shrink that on, heat expand and then cools on there. That looks fine. And otherwise also the, the rest of the part looks great. So I don't think I need to do anything with that. So I got all my parts there in a container. All right, looks good. Just a quick break to show some pics of where I used to go running before it got so cold here. These are the bearings that came out of the spindle top on my bridge port. They are brand Famfear, which has I think since been bought by Timken, which is probably bought by someone else. And it's got an M there, 207K, and then the DD I think indicates that it's double shielded. And then as far as I can tell, the C has to do with tolerance. And I think the larger the number, the larger the tolerance. So the C1 would be a bearing with the lowest uh, tolerance, tightest fit. I could not find these replacement bearings. I found some that were close and they were pretty expensive. So I decided to end up just going with H&W and uh, they said that they use NTN bearings. I think she told me they're 6207ZZ. I would have never been able to tell whether that was a sufficient replacement or not, but H&W has got a good reputation. So I just went with what they did. It really was not too expensive. I think it was something like $60, $70 for both shipped, which of course is not cheap, but but a lot of the ones that I was finding was more than that for an individual one before they started adding the shipping. So let's get these open and see how they compare. So here's the specifications on the box. And when I spin it, it's quiet. It doesn't like spin freely. It's a little bit similar to this one, although this one's slightly more sticky. And if I go fast, I can hear a little crunchiness, but this one was a lot very crunchy. All right, I'm gonna work on getting those put back in. Let's reassemble this. Two good bearings, bad bearings are over there. I'm having a hard time getting it to go in flat, so I'm gonna try putting that spacer I didn't want that bad bearing stuck in there. That's good, it's not really stuck. All right, so let's put that there. Again, that's the Fafnir bad bearing. The inner spacer in. There, that went in nicely. Then the outer tensioner, I'm gonna put some uh, no anti-seize grease on that. I'm gonna put this dialectic anti-seize grease. It prevents corrosion. I hope that's not gonna make it easier to vibrate loose. All right, put that in. Get my wrench. Just to make sure things are lined up, I'm gonna put this one in. You know what? I don't think I polished the inside of that ring. I think I'm gonna take it back out so I can polish the inside of that spacer. 
I have in that just tight enough to hold it. I don't want to make that egg shaped. That doesn't seem to be doing it. Let's see, let's do some fine emery paper. It doesn't have much grit on it. Now let's try this. This is not quite so worn out. This lathe in general rattles a lot. There's a lot of things that are not real tight on it. Okay, I've already polished this part. It goes on there nicely now. I'm sure I did not take any substantial amount with that fine emery paper. There is no indication of directionality on these, so they're not angular contact or anything. Maybe I can use this to push it down in. Now I'm back to this old game of not being able to hold it. So this little tool says Martin, two and a half inches, nine thirty seconds. I have no idea where it came from. Uh, I inherited it from my dad. I used a sander and reduced the diameter of that pin to go in here. I think whoever designs these kind of nuts ought to be taken to the woodshed. All right, well, that's flush from the top. Tighten that a little bit better once I get the whole thing in. Okay, now I've got to get this back out. This then goes in here like this. Is that right? No, it goes this way. I'm gonna to need to polish on the inside of this. It's got quite a bit of galling and I see a few burrs, so I'll be back. Okay, I've got this on my three jaw chuck gripped on the inside and I'm just gonna polish it in there. It's hard to do with that keyway there. Okay. I'm gonna use while I'm mounted on there uh, like a scraping tool to go in and clean that, that uh, keyway out. Okay, I took a little cutoff tool, just kind of went in the corners, got some of the grease out. I don't know that I did much. It still looks about the same. Put this in. So I don't even have to use my hammer. So that went in there pretty nicely. Okay, now this will go on here. And it looks like the tight fitting is between the bearing inner diameter and that shaft. This little homemade vise is what you get when you don't want to spend even the cheap money to get a Harbor Freight press. I'm fairly happy with it, except I used an old hydraulic jack that turned out to leak oil it terribly. We'll see whether I get any pumping power here. Yeah, it's like it's out of oil. All right, I have to get creative. Okay, sometime later I'm back. I took this all apart. Just the way that these are constructed, there's an outer uh, sleeve here, which is an oil reserve. Then there's an inner pipe, and that pipe is what this top screws into. And then there's a cylinder that's got a, a rubber gasket, which is what slides. And then the pump shuttles oil between the outer sleeve and then inside the pipe. So this pipe, uh, or this outer jacket, it comes down and it was sitting in a, a groove and there was no gasket or anything there. And it looks like it was just metal on metal, which is where I think it's been leaking from. I tried cleaning that out as best I could. Tried putting some silicone uh, gel in there. I don't know if that'll help at all. Put some more oil in and then tightened it up as, as best I could. Uh, there is a rubber gasket right inside this ring. Uh, it looked okay, it looked intact anyway, and I don't think it's leaking from up top. So we'll see. I have some other jacks I tried, but this has a wider diameter. I've got a ring here that holds it in place. I'd have to end up manufacturing a, a different one and putting different screws in, and that's my plan B. And then I had another tiny jack, which I could use, but anyway, I thought I would just try giving this one more chance. Take two. He's not in the right position. How did that happen? All right, I have to drive this back just enough that I can rotate uh, to get the key right. Okay, I've got it flipped around. All right, there it's at least started. It's leaking a little bit around this pump seal. I think this jack's days are numbered. 
That looks right. Okay, let me get this all put away and then we'll put our inner tensioning nut in. Okay, let's get back to this. I'm gonna put some anti-seize on these threads. All right, let's put some of the white stuff on. There we go. Messy. There's probably a better way to do this and not be so messy. These things just wouldn't cam out or pop out every time. It would be so much nicer. Tight as I can get it, which is not super tight. If I put it in the in the mill and have it all in there, it'll probably be quite a bit tighter. I don't like that. Yeah, that's got to change. That's going to have to be tighter. So I'm going to have to put this up where I can use the the castle teeth on the mill to get some counter force and then tighten that up so I'm not getting that that uh, clicking. Well, I can't get that center nut any tighter. There still is, you know, some play up and down. Now this is the pulley, it's, it's keyed. I don't really think there's gonna be a lot of force making it go up and down. So I don't know if that's where it should be. I mean, if it's completely tight, it would be, it might be binding against this outer housing. So I think that's the best that I can do. And then I'll have to see if it starts making a rattle. I may have to take it apart and figure, figure what I did wrong. All right, so now this needs to go back in here. The next thing I've got to deal with is the brake. There's a band that goes around here and then there's a handle right here. When that handle rotates, that little part there gaps it. The problem is on this one, it doesn't gap it quite enough because there's been wear on the outside. So the brake is kind of weak. It doesn't really stop the this part. That brake rubs on the inside here. So on the other mill that we're working on down in the maker space, I made a little 3D cap that kind of just slid right over the top of that and it added some width on both sides. And that worked real well. And that's what I would like to do, but my 3D printer is out of service right now. I'm gonna try to see if I can make a little cap out of a shim. We'll see how this works. Okay, here it is. Kind of fold it into a little box. See if I can slip it over the top of that. But I might try to solder something in there so that it holds together. Each one piece here is two thou. So that's ten thousandths added. All right, there it is. Not sure how long that will last. Let me see if I can get it soldered. Here goes nothing. I'm not confident about this. We'll see. I'm not even sure if solder will go on to, to brass shim stock. Seems to be taking it. Yeah, it's wicking it in. All right. I'm guessing these jaws are pulling a lot of the heat out of there. It doesn't want to wick it up in between those two layers. Now let's see if I filled it up so much with solder it won't go on. We'll see. There it is after I've soldered it a little bit, gave it a buff. Okay, there it is on there. At least the uh, walls aren't splaying out now like they were before. All right, so what a question of whether that'll be enough. We'll have to wait till we get it on. Well, guess what I just figured out? Bozo me. I apparently did not measure these when I thought that that was a quarter 28. In fact, it's a number 1228. The diameter on these is 226, not 250. So these pins will not hold, which means I have two options. Number one, to index and take the whole thing back apart, index and drill to get two more, or to make some pins that are quarter 28. And I'm gonna try to make pins, but I'm not happy about it. 
don't do that. Several hours later, I have some quarter 28 pins. I didn't show making them because I'm embarrassed at having screwed the whole thing up and it was a lot of struggle for me, <laughs> but I got it. I started out with single point threading, ended up just using a die and tried several different things, but finally got it. I need to cut some slits in the end so that I can drive it home with a screwdriver and then I'll be back to uh, where I started before I screwed it up with that die, trying to clean out the holes. Yeah, I cleaned it out all right. I don't think my brass cap spacer thing is going to work. If you listen, I'm hearing that brass and I think it's scraping up against the side. So I actually was down at the Knox Makers and I got some of the spacers I made for that. I made a bunch of them, so I'm hoping that one of these will work. Here are the sizes I have to choose from. They differ in their length, not in their width, so that they are have the effect as they twist. And of course, this is that metal cap that I tried making. So I'm gonna try this one. Got that there, that slides over that. Now let's get the brake back in and see if it uh, gaps it too much so that the brake is rubbing all the time or whether it's just perfect. And there I've got that cap and the flange is on the bottom so that when this thing is turned upside down, it won't fall off. And let's put this back in and see how it spins. Well, that's not gonna work. This is the brake and this thing won't even go over top of it. So it's already gapped out too wide. This is the brake shoe and this is up inside the step pulley. This is the way it would be up in there. If I put this in, it is too wide. It's already scraping in there. And I took the screwdriver, stick it in there like that. And if I rotate that to get it nice and tight, I'm calculating when I when I twist it and then I measure that gap, it's about 260 thousandths. And that piece there is wider than 260 thousandths by quite a bit. So I'm not sure why it's not grabbing just as it is. So I'm going to just put it back in again and look at it without. All right, this is without any gap uh, between that pin. Spins nicely, stops promptly, but even with it full width, I can still overcome it a little bit with my hand. I wish it was just a little bit tighter because like if I want to use that when I'm tightening up a collet to use that to keep it from rotating, I'm not sure if it's strong enough, but for right now I'm going to leave it without any gap. If, if it's just not working, I'll come back and make one of these, but make it thinner and see if we can do with that. Okay, I got slits cut on the top of my bolts. It's not exactly even. Got out a surface block and I blued it and laid it out and got it all marked perfect, but I didn't have an accurate way to do it. The best that I could come up with was this, and so it kind of slid off to one side, but it's not too bad. I drilled and tapped this just as a holder. That'll work. I saw online some solutions some people had where they would uh, mount a drill chuck here, put this in the drill chuck, and then put a slitting saw. And I have all those parts, but once I got the, I used a boring bar, and then I put an R8 collet through there and, and bolted it in the back. And by the time that the, the tip of the chuck was like right there, so there was no room for the slitting part. Furthermore, you would need to be able to go up and down so you don't just have a circular hole. So. I don't think that that would have worked. Of course, if I had a shaper, it would have worked good. I've had this back and forth many times. I can't remember what I've showed and haven't showed. Four springs go in here. This goes right down in there. I gotta wiggle it just right so it'll go down. Then I turn it over and rest this on here so that it'll push it down so that I can get the pins on the other side. I use my wrench here to get those lined up like that. Then I've got to get the ring. All right, I think that'll hold for a minute. Wish I'd made the pins a little bit longer, but I think they'll work. And we tighten up this set screw. So 
diameter of those pins is slightly too big for it to move sm smoothly, so I'm gonna need to take just a small amount off the diameter. Boy, I wish I wouldn't have screwed up those other pins. So these original pins are 311 thousandths, and I had thought that it was kind of a sloppy fit, so I was trying to make it a little bit wider to better fit this area, but it turns out that the place where it's binding is this slot. It's supposed to be able to go up and down. Even this 311 catches at one little point on that side, it does not catch on this side. So I'm also going to clean that up a little bit with a file. And I had made these 325, so I'll need to take them down to, I'll probably do 3, 311 or 310. I've got it working. I had to take the diameter down on my little lathe, which has a terrible surface finish, and I hope to never think or speak of this again. The whole thing was preventable if I just hadn't opened up that hole, but it's working. It's up and down, they seem nice and solid. I got my 3D printer going again, at least for now. This is as thin as I could make it. It's just one layer thick, so I think that's like 0.4 millimeters is the diameter of that. If I made any thinner, then the slicer program just didn't put a side on there at all. All right, I'm gonna get that on there and put it all back together and see how tight it is or, uh, or make sure it's not too tight. That little spacer seems to have done the trick. When I spin now, it stops at about 30 degree angle, whereas before it was going almost a full 90 degree angle and then it didn't feel like it was a firm uh, stopping point. So I'm happy with that. I'm gonna get this uh, back up on the head. I'm not gonna show that. I must have taken one of these things on and off about 10 times now, if not more. So I'm beginning to think of myself as a pro. So I'm gonna give you a pro tip. See right here, there's supposed to be a motor. Motor's gonna come down, there's gonna be a, a pulley right there. Pulley's gonna have the belt that's gonna go around it and it's gonna go around this. There's no way to get the pulley on unless the head is off. So, gotta undo all that. You gotta get this belt on first. Anyway, pro tip, belt on first. I don't know if that came across. I was trying to be silly and tongue in cheek about if I'm such a pro, why did I make the mistake to begin with? <laughs> anyway, I got it on. I wanna show something interesting I just noticed. I had never heard of or thought of this before. So this, is the nut that is uh, tightens up the motor after you tension it after the belt. And there's a handle, and that handle is attached to the, to the bolt. So that handle could be pointed any of 365 degrees when it comes to be tight. You don't want it sticking in, you really want it sticking out. So you want it clocked just right. So I noticed that I had this on here, uh, you know, before I took it off and it worked just fine. Then I came, and as I'm putting it back together, I flipped the nut upside down accidentally, and that actually changed the clocking. Um, because if you think about the spiral threads, uh, at, depending on how thick this is, it's gonna be a multiple of rotations. So the starting point relative to that attachment is gonna be different on one side versus the other. So if your thing isn't working just right, try flipping it over, it might help. Okay, so there it's pointed right where I want when, I, when, it's, uh, when it's tight. I want to take another quick break to show the property of my in-laws up in Deer Lodge, Tennessee. I love the mist coming up off that water. Uh, it's really peaceful to be up there. And here's my mom. She's 86 and still getting around great. She's broken her hip and has to have a little bit of assistance, but I'm real proud of her. She's the matriarch of our family. After all that fooling around, I didn't change the scraping at all. So it wasn't a bearing scraping. Uh, I'm gonna first of all show you that I've got the belt completely loose from the motor. So there's the motor and that's, you know, there's a little bit of, of the electronic noise, a little bit of that hum that comes from a BFD, but there's no scraping. So it's coming from the front end. And for the life of me, I cannot figure out what it is. Sounds like maybe it's scraping a bolt inside that step pulley.
Have I mentioned how many times I've had that head on and off? Urgh! I thought maybe that pulley was rubbing on the top of that. I don't know if I can show it, but I can see air between the two and it's not touching. So it's something that just clicking. Every, every time that this thing turns around one time, it clicks. Good morning, it's a new day. I'm gonna call this Mill Clicky. I have some thoughts uh, about what may be causing that rattle. Um, it's just a little click when I go slow. Of course, it gets to be quite a rattle when it's going fast. So my theory is that it's somehow interacting with that brake in there. So I'm gonna take it all apart, take the brake completely out, put it back in and see if the click is still there. At least that will give me an idea. And then if it is the brake, then I may put some fitting compound on the inside of that step pulley and then run it and then see if I can figure out where it's rubbing. So that's my goal. Okay, so I have showed before taking off the motor, taking off the, I keep calling it the head, but I guess it would be the cap, taking off or the cover, taking that off, uh, flipped it over, got the brake out, put the whole thing back in together. And now, there is no clicking sound. So it is the brake that is the problem. I had wondered whether perhaps that top thing was rubbing against the top or some inside that cover, but that doesn't seem to be the issue. So. Now there was a click because that thing can move up and down. But I think that's fine. So now I gotta figure out how that brake is interfering. And I thought, well, maybe my cap was what was doing it. But actually, the walls of that cap fell apart. And when I took it apart, that's what I was left with. So I don't think that's it. I think it must be that one of these screws was raised up above the top level or something like that. So. That's what my next goal is to um, get it back to take it back off, get the brake in, and then try to investigate that. All right, I've got this back off. I've got the brake in here. When I run my finger, there's definitely a a, a, a step up. So this is uh, above the surface of that. If I look here, there's kind of a rotational, a curved mark there, and I'm wondering if that's not the place that's been rubbing. Now it would be in the wrong position. Like maybe that screw would should be here and then that would, would have correspond with, with the angle of the brake and of the inside of that step pulley. Um, I'm going to try just sanding off the top of this just a little bit and see if that makes any difference. We had quite a rain last night. I don't think it'll pick up here, but the crows are waking up the morning. Got my door open, got my fan running to kind of swap the air out in here. Okay, I have this, the screws back in. The one that I took the top off, I put back in this position because I think that's where it was before. I also cleaned the surface that these bolts made up against. There was some paint on there and I just took off any burrs with this file. So I'm gonna put this back in again. Um, next time I'm not gonna put the, the flat belt. That's the part that makes it hard to take on and off and that does not seem to have any effect on the rattle. So I'm gonna leave that off just for right now while I'm testing it for the, uh, the interference. So let me get this back in and get this cap back on. Okay, it is my belief that it is one of these screws that is striking inside here. And I don't know if it is the screw or whether it's the position, as in does it matter which screw is in which uh, spot. But for right now, I've put Dicom, the steel bluing stuff, 
onto here. I'm going to put that back on and run it and then see if I can find any marks of interference. Okay, well I expected I was gonna still hear the rattling when I had just the bolts, but not the brake shoe, but I'm not really hearing it. Maybe there is. Let's try it in slow-mo. Man, this is really a puzzle. I can't figure out, I can't figure out what would be rubbing. And even if it was rubbing, you know, I would think that this, this being an old brake shoe, it would be, it would be down. And you know, I'm not putting in that cap in, I'm not doing any of that now. So I do not know what is rubbing in there. Strange. Well, consistent with the fact that there was no rubbing with just the screws, there's no wear on any of those surfaces. All right, I've got the brake shoe back in here. I'm looking all the way around. You know, there's no metal or anything extending out there. You know, it's smooth there, it's smooth there. You know, I wondered whether that little metal piece down there could be interfering, but if that was true, then, you know, when I take this shoe off, that was still there. So you would think it would have the same interference, so. I have taken and put Dicom all the way around on the inside here, and I hope I have it good enough that I can see scraping when I'm done. Of course, it's not completely even in density, so that may be difficult, but that's my next trial. Well, I don't know what I've done differently, but it doesn't seem to be scraping now. I've got the brake shoe in there. I kept each screw going into into one particular spot the same this time before I was kind of putting them into a jumble and then just picking one but this time you know after it didn't scrape with just the bolts themselves I thought well maybe I just happened to stumble across the right uh, positioning so I kept it maybe that was a difference now when I raise this up well before there was a little bit of a clicking but it doesn't seem to be now Well, I guess the only thing to do now is to take it back apart and put that flat belt in there. See if that, if it, I guess if it doesn't click then, I'm gonna be happy, even though I don't know what I did. Just in case it didn't really show up before, and, and because maybe this will be the last time I put that on there, let me just show one more time. That flat belt, I squeeze it together to get at least this edge up around that side. I then have a 15 16 wrench, which then I just start turning. As the weight of the head starts riding down, that belt, or pushing down, the belt will start riding upward. And then sometimes I have to take a flat bar under the belt and like lift it up. And I just have to keep working. And, and then towards the end, I really have to push down here pretty hard. And then once it finally snaps into place, then it turns easily. So it's just using that wrench to turn that and getting that to ride up on there. You know how you're on a journey? My dirty hands. You know how you're on a journey and you think, I'm almost there. I can see the lights in the window burning for me in the night. Okay, so it's not rubbing. I've now found another problem. Let me show you. When the head, when it's in this position, which lets this fall down, this then lets that part in there with its castle nuts engage with the top of the spindle and that works fine. When you put it into this mode, now it won't go anything because this is wanting to turn it one way and then it's, you know, it's all bound up. So then what you're supposed to do is raise this up, that pulls that up, disengages the castle nuts from the top of the spindle and then lets it spin, but it doesn't work. And why doesn't it work? Well, if you look here, there's still that much to go up. Like if I take my flat bar right there, 
and hold that up, then it's free. So what's happening is this thing is not going up based on the, these pins. And if I look at them closely, pins have kind of a downward slant. In other words, these pins are not doing their job to pull the thing up. I'm kind of discouraged about these pins in general. These are the ones that I made. And I think maybe I didn't have the steels not hardened or I, I didn't do something right. You know, I, I cut these with a die, so the diameter should be okay. But I've noticed as I'm taking them in and taking them out that the threads hardly even hold anymore. And there's a little set screw in the top here and I have to bind that against that. And then when I take it out and I look, it's just buggering up the threads. So maybe what I've got to do is take this apart and maybe drill and tap another set of holes, which will have to be exactly 180 degrees to use the old pins. And I'll have to do that, that smaller tap size. I think I'm almost there, but then it's not quite. But it's been a long journey. Just be patient. My wife keeps telling me, just enjoy the journey. Don't, don't stress about what, how long it takes you to get there. Uh, that's good advice. And I think I'm going to take a break for today because at least I've solved one problem. I need to celebrate in my successes. I've stopped the, the rattling. How I did it? No clue. You followed along through there with me. And if you can figure out what I did, let me know in the comments. Well, I put a collet and a mill in there, an end mill. You can see that my drawbar is not straight. And now I'm back having a vibration. I'm trying to work on getting that step pulley to go up and down so that it releases the castle connection and allow the back gear. Those pins I showed before were kind of flopping a little bit. I tapped and threaded a uh, bar and then took the outside diameter to 7 16 and I'm putting this in. This is a quarter 20 whereas what I originally tapped it was quarter 28 and I think those threads kind of got buggered out because these other ones weren't even really holding anymore. I think part of it's because they weren't hardened. You can see they've kind of gotten all you know that when the set screw comes down it's smashing those threads anyway even with this though these were not flopping when i when i would move the handle back and forth but it still wasn't raising it up just quite enough so i'm gonna make this little thing as a shim to go underneath that which will then raise it up a little bit and i've already put this on there and it's a little bit too thick this thing initially came was part of this I got this as part of a lot in an auction. It's a step pulley, but doesn't even have a key in it. So I really wouldn't have a use for it. I need to take this off. I'm gonna try taking off about another 20 thousandths. I don't know how thin I can actually get this. It's currently 60 thousandths thick. And I think if I take 20 more off, that's probably about as thin as I'm gonna be able to go. This thing's so thin that I can't really squeeze it very tight, and it's certainly chattering a lot there, but I think I took off 30,000. It seemed to be going okay, so I kept going. I couldn't cut all the way into the middle, so I have to use this uh, deburring tool to get that inner part. All right, I'll show it after I get it on. All right, I had to turn down the head of these bolts because as this rotates around to here, with that part being thicker, it was jamming there, so the head actually needs to be able to go into that slot. So the diameter of that needs to be the same seven, I think what I say, seven to sixteenths, 0 0.312. Uh, and I did the same thing here. Here is the uh, the shim. It um, is not perfect. Like that seems to be, that goes down all the way and it's engaged well. Then when I go up, that's about as far up as I can get it. You know, I thought by making it a little bit thinner, I could then get this pin all the way up to here, but that holds. And you see now this is free. This part and the top of the spindle are disconnected. Uh, I'm okay with that for now. I almost never use that reverse gear, especially now that I have a DRO and, and I don't usually need to go that slow. I mean, if for some reason I have to do slow and I find that it's slipping back, then I may have to uh, you know try to find another solution, but I think that's good for now. Okay, everyone, I'm gonna call it finished. You know, with anything like this, there's always more that can be done. At some point, I'd like to add a digital readout to it. I have a power feed that I can put on there, but I'm gonna hold off on that because uh, it may be that the power feed from my other mill, which is down at Knox Makers, may be coming home. And I may use that instead and then use the new one on the Z-axis. Uh, so anyway, that's it's an add-on. Um, I'm pretty happy with it. So. Uh, 
Thank you for watching and I just realized I need to show first chips. Let's see if we can put this to work. All right, let's go up 10 thousandths. Let's take a 10 thousandths cut. I like it. All right. This is an old end mill holder that's gifts from my lathe that I got as part of a lot in, a, in an auction. Okay, there's my finished surface. It's designed to go into that holder there. It'll, uh, the reason I like this is it holds these triangular inserts and I have a bunch of those and I have the ability to sharpen them. So I think that that will work well for me. I think those chips look pretty good. Okay, first chip's done. Let's clean up and I christen it complete. Still don't have a name for it. I had previously said I was gonna call it the beast. That was gonna be beauty. That was gonna be the beast. Ah, I think I like it. That's what it is, it's the beast. Just a final survey. I added that call it holder. At some point I'll get it down off those concrete blocks. But I'm tall and I kinda actually like it up the height when it's up at a higher height. Very pretty. I like it a lot. Bye. Okay, that's all for today. Again, if you like it, thumbs up and some comments. It's just a little bit before Christmas as I'm filming this, so I wish from my family to all of you, I hope that you have a wonderful Christmas season and I hope that everyone's safe, especially with traveling. I'm going to go back into lurk mode for a little bit. I'll come back when I have something more to say. But so if you'll keep subscribed, maybe it won't be too long. I'll find something to be worth posting about. Hope you all have a Merry Christmas. Thank you for watching. Peace out.